Well, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some of you may have seen the story written on uh, page three of the UK column. So you may be familiar with it, uh, but obviously I'll go into it in a lot more detail now, and uh, I will invite a few questions if there's anything you'd like to, uh, to tell me afterwards. Now, I'm going to tell the story. It's a complex story, as these stories tend to be, and I will be moving around a little bit chronologically, so I hope not to confuse everybody. I'll try to make it as comprehensive as I possibly can, but um, that's you'll understand once I get into it is why I've had to juggle around a little bit. Uh, there are two key elements in this story that I think most of you in this room will recognize straight away. One is the sickening and harrowing uh, treatment dished out to defenseless victims. The other is the indifference and the collaboration of the authorities afterwards. And in this particular case, we believe it takes this to the very top of the government in Scotland goes that far and I'll demonstrate why that is the case now first of all I'll, I'll tell you the story how it began began as uh, it, the story is, revolves around Aberdeen and it involves a family called the Mackey family it's a man called Dennis Mackey his wife Anne and they had two children first a boy called Greg and the second a few years later a daughter called Holly now, Holly was born with Down syndrome and had a lot of other serious medical difficulties as well. She was not expected to live, but live she did with enormous willpower, which I can testify to right now. Now, the family were, sort of, I suppose, a normal, normal family as one would expect, although Dennis was a womanizer and uh, could be violent at times. But the marriage went on. Um, in t I'll take you up to 2000. In the year 2000, when Holly was 20, um, there was a violent disagreement between Dennis and Anne Mackey. So, uh, she's Anne Gregg now, which is a, a maiden name, which is reverted to for reasons which would be obvious. Um, now, during the course of this uh, violent argument, the husband got so violent that Anne had to take her daughter with her physically away from the house because things had got so bad. To cut a long story short, Holly became hysterical and demanded to be taken back to the house. And her mother said, why have we got to go back, Holly? Why have we got to go back? And Holly said, we've got to go back because Daddy will kill Max. Max was Holly's pet dog to whom she was devoted. <coughs> so, of course, the mother said, of course not, Holly. He's not going to kill Max. He's just angry with Mummy. He's, he's not going to do anything to Max. No, no, he'll kill, he'll kill Max if we don't go back. We've got to go back for him. So Anne couldn't understand this almost hysterical behaviour by her daughter. But then, through prompting her, it all came out. She told her, she told her mother that from the age of six, her father had started sexually abusing her. A little later on, she, a little later on, she had encouraged the, he had encouraged the brother to join in. So, from the age of six, Holly was being abused by her father. Anne immediately, of course, went to uh, the police station, Buxburn Police Station in Aberdeen, to report this, uh, and um, put the report through, of course. Uh, Anne, of course, initially didn't believe it. She thought this was too incredible, but she asked Holly, who was a very truthful girl, and she said, no, Mummy, it's all happened. It's all happened, Mummy. But Daddy said he would kill Max, and he'd kill you if I ever told anybody about it. Now, uh, this was reported to the police, and of course Anne and Holly naturally left the, uh, the, the, the household to find somewhere else to live. That wasn't the end of the story, because this happened in May 2000. On the 24th of August 2000, the story developed even further. When, Anne, when Holly said to Mummy, I started telling about other things. She says, there were other people, you know, Mummy. It wasn't just Daddy and Greg. There was other people as well. So Anne said, are you sure about this? Are you absolutely sure? Yes, Mummy, and I'll tell you who they are. And she named another 14, 14 abusers, men and women. And amongst those abusers were the sh a sheriff, Sheriff Graham Buchanan, a police officer, Terry Major, two nurses, Two social workers, including the social worker who is responsible it was to care for Holly, and a number of other policemen as well, including an accountant and another lawyer. 
Now, at that time, after, of course, then Anne immediately rang the police station again to ask, A, what progress they've got, and B, that she had a lot of other names to give to them. So, the police officer invited her around to Bucksburn Police Station the following day, which would be the 25th of August, 2000. And there, she was met by a police officer called Leanne Davidson and a social worker called Nicola Foote. Now, Anne and Holly together sat and get, went through all the allegations, gave all the details, all the names. And later on, uh, the Leanne Davidson said she wanted to speak to Anne on her own and that the social worker would take care of Holly for a while. Well, the social worker, no sooner had she got Holly by herself, that she injected a needle into her leg, called her a liar, and, and with the injection, there was a substance that disorientated Holly. Now, when Holly had uh, uh, finished, or when Anne had finished with uh, Leanne Davidson, the officer who was uh, doing the investigation, uh, she noticed that her daughter was in uh, great distress, and of course, being town syndrome, she couldn't explain exactly what had happened, other than she'd been injected. Anne immediately sort of said to the police, I want a doctor to see her now, you've done something to her, I want a doctor here. Of course, the police kept her, kept her there saying they were trying to find a doctor, but they couldn't find one. And she sat there for three hours until, presumably, the drug had started to, war to wear off. In fact, Anne took the daughter to her own doctor the following day, and of course, he couldn't find anything, but he said, well, the kind of drug that was injected would be one that would be not possible to trace 24 hours later. Now, that, obviously, all that information then had been given to the police, and Anne expected that action would be taken. But time went on. For a week or two weeks, nothing happened. Eleven days after Anne had been to the police station in Aberdeen to give out all the names of these well-known and eminent people, there was a knock on her door. Ten people from the local uh, psychiatric institution grabbed Anne, pulled her trousers down, injected her, and threw her into a van leaving Holly screaming in the flat that they had. She was taken to Cornhill Hospital in Aberdeen, where the doctor concerned, responsible for this, a man called Dr. Alistair Palin, uh, described her as schizophrenic. Fortunately, Anne is uh, a very resolute and smart woman, and she very, very cleverly played the game with the people. Oh, she was terrified for herself and even more terrified for her daughter, who meantime had been handed back to her father, and she managed to get out after a few days from Cornhill Hospital. What she did then was another very smart thing. She went straight to an eminent psychiatrist, one of the leading psychiatrists in Scotland, called Dr. Ellen Smith, went to her at her own expense and said, Dr. Smith, I've been put into, I've never had any, medical, any mental problems in my life. I've been put into an institution where Dr. Alistair Palin has certified that I'm schizophrenic. I don't know if there's anything wrong with me too. Will you do all the tests you can on me and come out with an honest appraisal of my mental state? Dr. Smith did a full appraisal, which obviously we have the documentary evidence, saying there was absolutely nothing wrong with Anne whatsoever. She'd been virtually kidnapped to try to, to make sure that she couldn't say anything, to be discredited and for Holly to be given back to her paedophile father. And of course, they were so worried about all the names that had been mentioned. Now, uh, Anne got back home and got with Holly and all the rest of it and tried very hard to get things going. But the case never took off, which I don't suppose will surprise anybody in this room, knowing the things that we know. And the, at the time, the case was effectively blocked by the Procurator Fiscal in Aberdeen. Now, the Procurator Fiscal in Scotland is like the uh, Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales. They decide whether charges should be laid and all the rest of it, having examined the evidence. Uh, now, Mrs. Angelini was, was the Procurator Fiscal at the time, later to become Lord Advocate, which is very relevant to the story as it stands now. So nothing at all happened, uh, despite all the pressure that Anne was putting on, and with the help of some of her lawyers as well, but nothing happened, and the whole case was dismissed. The police actually said that they had uh, only interviewed Dennis Mackey, and two years later, the son, Greg Mackey, which they have confirmed in writing, but we shall show that that is false in a little while. Now, Anne tried everything 
from that time to try and get the story out. There were other issues, including financial issues, divorce issues, which I won't go into during the course of this talk, but a lot of very, very serious issues.